Hello fellow sand lovers and welcome to the second part on this video series on the six predicaments. In the last video we approached these six predicaments from a phenomenological perspective and also did a graphical presentation of the meaning of the six predicaments. In this video we are more interested in applying those six predicaments to a more familiar themes and discussions that we have. Now quite often it is the case that we have a debate between two opposite parties uh, where both of them get something right. In other words, if we have group A arguing for A and group B arguing for B, and the fact of the matter is that in our experience we encounter both phenomena type A and B, uh, the problem with these conversations is that these groups try to reduce everything to either uh, being A or B. Now what these six predicaments can help us is to conceptualize and see this tension between two opposites and uh, give us a more coherent and logical way to uh, think about these problems. It tries not to reduce the uh, complexity or many-sidedness of reality to one uh, singular aspect of it. What I want to show is just the fruitfulness of these six predicaments and how they can enlighten very uh, diverse and various aspects and discussions that we have. But enough talking, here's the video. The tension between originality or freedom and conventionality or constraint is a well-known tension and we could approach this tension for example in the context of music. Now think about blues. Blues has a quite a rigid conventionality in it. We have for example the 12 bar blues which is in its structure very rigid. However within these constraints or conventions there lies unlimited freedom for self-expression. If there were no rules or conventions or constraints at all, could we really express ourselves in the same sense? In order to be original, the artist has to learn conventions. We have to learn the rules first, and only after that we can twist, bend and break them. For example, one of the greatest jazz players of all time, Charlie Parker, said, you got to learn your instrument, then you practice, practice, practice. And then, when you finally get up there on the bandstand, forget all that and just wail. Or we can take a look at the early work of Pablo Picasso. In his early works, the style is very realistic. He's learning the conventions. He's learning the necessary skills in order to better express himself. He has to learn the rules before he can break them and create something completely novel. This tension can also be seen in the fact that every creation, regardless how novel it seems, always draws inspiration from something old. Every new idea is not completely detached from everything else, that is, it's not pure firstness, as it grows out of other previous ideas. For example, there's a quote by Pablo Picasso where he says, bad artists copy, good artists steal. Perhaps one of the greatest thinkers alive today is Elon Musk. One of his most audacious goals is to create a self-sustaining colony on Mars for humanity. Now, Elon Musk has been quoted saying that the book that has influenced him the most is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Man, I love that book. Tracing backwards, Douglas Adams expressed multiple times his admiration for the great American novelist Kirk Vonnegut. Vonnegut has been quoted to say the classic Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift before him had a major impact on his thinking. I believe we're seeing a trend here. Until now we have viewed the tension between firstness and secondness of thirdness as the tension between originality and novelty and conventionality or constraint. But there is a more political aspect of this tension as well and this tension is between the complete individual freedom and the constraints of norms, traditions and culture. Now, the modern era of enlightenment and liberalism is centered around the idea that 
individuals should be completely free from the surrounding environment or culture. The great story of liberalism is the great emancipation from the constraints of community, tradition, religion, time and place. That all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain rights and that among these rights are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men uh, and derive their just powers from the consent of the people. People coming together in a condition of freedom desire to secure their rights, life, liberty and property for Locke. And to secure these rights, we establish governments not to tell us what to do, but to make our rights secure, the rights to pursue life, liberty, and in Locke's case, property. What Locke proposes is that freedom is when you can do the things that you want to do unimpeded by obstacles, particularly obstacles of other people and also nature itself. Now we'll see how this kind of freedom comes very close to pure firstness completely unchained, completely without constraints, completely free, without any attachments or connections or relation to anything other. You are your own master. You are completely free individual. The problem in some ways that Locke immediately confronts is that you can only in some ways do this, do the political act, if you're in some senses free in all aspects of life. What good is it to say that we go behind the veil of the state of nature and say that we can consent to a free government if we're still defined by who we are, by our last names, by our relationships to others, by our lineage, by our inheritance, by our places? And so Locke understands that to be truly a person who can be free in the sense of capable of making the free choice of what kind of government, what kind of politics we should have, you have to be free in every respect. But of course, in this pursuit of complete freedom, the tension becomes clear. Although we think that we are after complete freedom, we still need culture and norms and conventions in order to have some unity in our being. We search for some kind of stability. Although we say we want complete freedom, at the same time, we also want conventions, traditions and rituals. Maybe one of those first great movies uh, of our tradition, The Wizard of Oz. Right? That movie begins with Dorothy expressing her great discontent with living in this unjust place, in this place where no one gets her, which her authentic identity is not allowed to flourish. And as that movie begins, what does she do? She sings a song somewhere over the rainbow. There's a better place than this place. Uh, there's, a, there's somewhere else where I can be where I think I can live the kind of life that I want to live. Uh, of course, by the end of this movie, again, expressing a deep American paradox, she's saying there's no place like home. Uh, this is kind of built into this, is that even as, in some ways you could say, as a, as a philosophy, liberalism institutionalizes discontent. I think that's one way to express it. It sort of makes discontent a kind of basic feature of our lives, always evaluating whether this is the place I want to be. You know, is there some other school where I would be happier? Is there some other city I should be living in? That the same kind of institutionalized discontent uh, about places um, uh, also leads, it leads to a condition in which it's difficult for us to um, ascertain where home is. Uh, is there a place that we can think of as home? The tension between chaos and order may be one of the more familiar tensions. In this next clip, Jordan Peterson gives us a great example of the meaning of chaos and order in our everyday experience. There's this old Taoist symbol, the yin and yang symbol, mm -hmm. eh? So there's a black serpent, and it has a white dot in it, and there's a white serpent, and it has a black dot in it, and they're tail to tail. And that whole symbol is Tao. You say, well, what's order and what's chaos? Well, order is when you're where, what you're doing is producing what you want to have happen. Okay, so why is that orderly? It's because you can predict it. Mm -hmm. You do A, and you want B to happen, and B happens. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? It means you know where you are, you know what you're doing, and things are working. Mm -hmm. And then you're calm, because there's nothing to be nervous about, and you're moderately happy, because mm -hmm. you're getting what you need and want. And there's evidence that you are competent, because that's why things are working. Mm -hmm. That's order. 
Now, everyone knows that order can be shattered into disorder at the drop of a hat. You can be walking down the street and you're all happy and you're with your partner and, you know, she makes a mistake and steps off the curb and a bus hits her. It's like in one second you mm -hmm. are not anymore in order. Mm -hmm. Like the bottom has fallen out of your life and that's why there's a black dot in the white serpent. It's like the orderly as it is, look the hell out because mm -hmm. your life can be flipped upside down in a moment. Right. Okay. Well, then sometimes you're in a dire strait state and everything looks absolutely hopeless and you get a new realization and bang you know everything snaps together and so that's when you're in chaos and order can reveal itself mm -hmm. so there's a tension between chaos and order even in the most rigid kind of order there's always a bit of chaos involved that means that no structure can crystallize completely even the most stable structures and systems can dissolve into chaos. In a nutshell, nothing is eternal. On the other hand, chaos, in a sense, is the simplest kind of order. Chaos is such a misunderstood word. You see, for many people, chaos means disorder. Curiously, chaos, as studied in modern science, and many people speak of the new science of chaos, chaos is a type of order. It's a type of unstable order in which the temporal sequences are very complex. Chaos and order have also a more precise meaning in system theory. In systems theory, self-sustaining or self-organizing systems are seen to be far from equilibrium. That means that they are between chaos and order. It is precisely this tension between chaos and order that makes it possible for systems to organize themselves and further complexity. The growth of complexity that we witness in our universe is made possible precisely by this tension between chaos and order. This new set of theories around self-organization recognizes a complex interplay between order and chaos. Whether we use the more scientific terminology of a system being far from equilibrium, or the more catchy term of edge of chaos, this new vocabulary has built into it a recognition that self-organization, evolution, and novelty thrive on a dynamic interplay between order and disorder because it is only when there is a sufficiently high enough level of entropy and disorder within the system that a weak fluctuation can be amplified into a new pattern of order. But when the system settles into an equilibrium or stable configuration, this no longer becomes possible. When the system is far from its equilibrium, it can find a dynamic state between order and chaos that enables it to continue generating novel phenomena and regenerate itself for prolonged periods of time through self-organization. This is a very interesting theme that I want to pursue at some point in the future videos. The tension between individuality and unity has, of course, many meanings. But maybe one of the more familiar ones is the tension between what we may call individualism and collectivism. As I see it, in their more radical forms, both of them are guilty of trying to reduce the whole of experience to one side of it. Now, we find the most extreme versions of individualism in economic theory, or to be more precise, in neoclassical economic theory. In orthodox economics, the consumer is a set entity with set preferences and reacts in the same way to those set preferences all the time. It is a machine, but a very bizarre machine, because a machine disconnected from all other human activity. The orthodox consumer that uh, Amartya Sen properly calls a social moron, but it's not quite right. A social moron, a moron in any sense, is still connected. This is something much worse, a completely disconnected entity. A set of entities disconnected from each other and only connected through preferences. We see furthermore how this connects to the liberal view of freedom as freedom from any constraints or this detachment from surrounding environment. You are completely detached, you are completely free from any obligations or connections to other individuals or traditions. 
Mrs. Thatcher believed it was up to individuals and families to help themselves, famously saying, there's no such thing as society. I say that man is entitled to his own happiness and that he must achieve it himself, but that he cannot demand that others give up their lives to make him happy. I and read. nor should he wish to sacrifice himself for the happiness of others. But this kind of extreme individualism or the view that we are all living for ourselves leads quite naturally to the view that it is self-interest that motivates us and our behavior that we all as individuals are in the last instance selfish. Another step in this argument is to say that all um, behavior can be interpreted as self-interested. In all systems, whether you call them socialism, capitalism, or anything else, people act from self-interest. This, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. And so therefore, we might as well assume that everybody's self-interested because after all, I can always say that what you do is self-interest. So if you help someone else, that's your self-interest. If you hurt someone else, it's your self-interest. And it's been pointed out many times that that is a non-answer because it is, means that you can explain nothing by something that can explain everything. It's well known in science, if something is tautological, it explains nothing whatsoever. If I say God is good in every instance, then the meaning of God is good disappears because there's no way to say the opposite. There are people who actually believe that you can interpret everything as self-interest, in which case you cannot say that it's useful right or wrong, because you can also interpret as non-self-interest in the same way. Now, as we have already seen, this kind of extreme individualism emphasizes the particular, the individual and, in the last instance, also self-interest. That is, it emphasizes secondness. But by doing so, it ignores the underlying unity that we have. That is, the firstness of thirdness. We are not completely separate from one another, but we are all part of a larger whole. In the last instance, that is our universe. And here we can see the tension between individuality and unity. Although we are, of course, individuals, there is also this kind of underlying unity that connects us all to a common whole, to a common continuity. I do not believe that the individual is a sufficient... Um, is a sufficient ideal in order to preserve societies, in order to to help us get out of this meaning crisis or this, this crisis of Western civilization. We are people, as individuals, we are heavily structured by the environment. I know that when you're young, you like to think that you are unique, but it's absolutely not true. And as you get older, you realize how not true it is. But you also see it when you observe people acting as a collectivity, and suddenly you see the collectivity part come out, uh, and the individual differences in their proper place, which is that they are second order small. Because these things are the facts of the existence of individuals. I mean, anyone who's been in any country they immediately recognize that there are national differences. People behave, how they feel, how they think, even in capitalist countries, that's absolutely true. Uh, what they eat, and these are not just personal preferences, these are socially structured. Of course there's also the other extreme, the view that we are mere cogs in the machine, that we are part of larger processes that we cannot influence. In this other extreme, the individual has no agency. Agency is transferred to some higher entity, to group or community, or some other higher order phenomena. Again, the point is to recognize the tension. Of course we are individuals, of course we have agency, of course we have particular personalities, but we can't reduce everything to individuals. The reality is not just a set of individuals, but there is unity that unites us into a continuous whole. Now, by concentrating solely on the individual and the particular, that is secondness, we may end up breaking the unity, the glue of society that holds us together, that makes us feel that we are in the same boat. Tyranny of the specific, 
a tyranny of the individual is that instead of us all kind of looking towards something which unites us, what ends up happening is in our distraction, in the fact that we've lost this common focus, we start to focus on uh, specific things, arbitrary things start to pop up and then take up our attention. But I want to take us back to the question or the theme of selfishness, because that leads us to a very interesting tension between two kinds of love, eros and agape. The first part of this is to say that there are two kinds of love abroad in the universe, agape and eros. And agape is the love that desires the full development and reaching the greatest potentials for the loved one, mm -hmm. for the love object. Mm -hmm. It's a selfless love. It's a benevolent love. It's an empathic love. It's a love with no strings. It's a love with nothing in it for the lover, but all for the loved one. Mm -hmm. Eros, on the other hand, is the other kind of love, and that love desires the love object, desires that object because it has qualities that it finds valuable. It wants to be enriched by the love object. It mm -hmm. wants to grow through interaction with the love object. It wants to evolve and become more through encounter with the love object. And so here with Eros, the lover grows. The lover is uh, very much involved as opposed mm -hmm. to agape. Yeah. And the growth of the lover is central. Mm -hmm. And it's the love of desire for the love object. Now, extreme individualism supports Eros and sees that Eros is the only kind of love that there is. And cannot man have self-esteem if he loves his fellow man? What's wrong with loving your fellow man? Christ, every important moral leader in man's history, has taught us that we should love one another. Why then is this kind of love in your mind immoral? It is immoral if it is a love placed above oneself. It is more, more than immoral, it's impossible. Because when you are asked to love everybody indiscriminately, that is to love people without any standard, to love them regardless of the fact of whether they have any value or virtue, you are asked to love nobody. Now I understand that to speak about love as some kind of a force in our universe sounds very esoteric. But when we reflect on this issue, we see how we already believe that. Think about evolution, Darwinian evolution, or what we may call the survival of the fittest. That is complete eros. That is a view that every living thing or organism survives only because that organism is selfish. The organism is motivated only by its own self-interest. For Darwin, nature was savage. Every creature was locked in a desperate struggle for survival ultimately ending in death. Darwin showed that nature was a battlefield and that everything was in competition. But of course we also perceive altruistic behavior in nature. How could we explain that? Now a very interesting hypothesis is from Richard Dawkins, which he made in his book The Selfish Chain. Now I haven't read the book and this is by no means a critique of the theory. What I want to point out is that that hypothesis, at least as I understand it, builds upon this notion of selfishness. But now the agency is not in the individual, but on the genes. The survival of the fittest really means the survival of genes, because it is only genes that really survive down through many generations. A gene that didn't look after its own interests would not survive. That's the meaning of the phrase, selfish gene. Selfish genes give rise to altruistic individuals. My feeling is that the, the phenomena that we see, which, which you've described as empathetic, are phenomena which need explaining. Mm -hmm. And we're going to explain them, in, in my case, we're going to explain them in terms of selfish genes. So, as I interpret it, altruism or acarpe for Richard Dawkins are not fundamental properties of our reality, but something that emerges out of self-interest and more specifically, 
selfish genes. So for Richard Dawkins, the basic form of love in our universe is eros, that operates at the level of genes. So evolution is driven by the self-interest of individual genes. Now notice how this is familiar and almost analogical to the neoclassical view on individuals, which operate only on the basis of self-interest. In both cases, reality is reduced solely to individuals and self-interest. That is, in a broad sense, secondness. In human relations and in human interactions, Agape and Eros are both involved. Rarely is it just one. Mm -hmm. Usually it's both. And what we need in our love interactions with other people is a balance between the two, the balance between Agape and Eros. And th the important thing is that in those actions, Agape must hold a place of primacy. It must always be the... the the ultimate consideration in the love exchange. Mm -hmm. And if Eros would take the primacy, then the enrichment of the lover becomes most important, and the primacy and, and agape is pushed aside, mm -hmm. then we have what I call greed. Mm -hmm. Because greed is the desire of for enrichment by the love object without regard to the welfare of that love mm -hmm. object. See, agape is gone. Yeah. So there's the desire for the welfare and the growth of that love object is gone too. Mm -hmm. And that's for me the third point, the very definition of greed is where the primacy has been toppled mm -hmm. in relationship to other people, but also to the world. I mean, you mm -hmm. see the primacy of agape toppled if the environment is abused. Mm -hmm. So any way that the primacy of the development of the love object is pushed out is a problem. Again, my point is not to argue that there would be no self-interest or selfishness in our reality or, uh, or in our society. That would be making the exact same mistake of neglecting an element of reality by the expense of some other element. This is exactly what I mean by dualistic thinking. Now, the problem is that we reduce everything to self-interest and individuals. In that sense, we neglect one part of reality. The point I'm trying to make is that how we would have a world view or a philosophy that could see this tension and could regard both sides as real elements of reality. More precisely, how we could conceptualize this tension. And I claim that with these six predicaments we can form a coherent logical diagram and a philosophy that can incorporate all of these tensions and all of these aspects of the reality that we experience. So where this all leads us? The six predicaments are six aspects or elements that are present in every possible phenomena, just like the three categories. That means that when we encounter something in our experience, we can analyze and categorize that through these six predicaments. In other words, everything we encounter has some element of freedom in it, that is, firstness, but also some constraints, that is, secondness or thirdness. Furthermore, this thing is a part of some pattern or a law or a habit, that is, thirdness. But the order is never so rigid that it wouldn't have an element of chaos in it. That is the firstness of secondness. Furthermore, this thing is an individual or a particular thing that we can single out in our experience. That is secondness. But on the other hand, it's a part of a whole. It's deeply connected to everything else. It's a part of a larger process or a pattern that welds us into a common continuum. That is the firstness of thirdness. What I have tried to argue in this video is that there are tensions in our world. We have a bad habit to think dualistically. By that I mean that when we encounter some tensions, we try to, try to reduce that tension to either this or that side. The world is not 
one-sided place, which is either complete order or complete chaos. But the thing is the tension itself. The reality is a dynamic interplay between these opposites. And I argue that the Persian worldview, and especially the six predicaments and the three tensions, help us to make sense of those tensions and keep us away from mentality of trying to reduce things to just one aspect. The six predicaments is a fruitful way of thinking and it keeps our mind open in the sense that it always uh, shows us how every possible phenomena is always a combination of different opposites and is inherently has these tensions in it. It's a very dynamical uh, tool to explore the world. So I hope these six predicaments uh, have now become clearer in your mind and maybe even you can try to uh, use this tool in your own experience when you encounter some uh, phenomena or wh whatever that may be. But until next time, good sign hunting.